51. Welcome to the second half of the Hustlers University. You should have surely learned a lot so far. I know what you're thinking. Andrew, you've already taught me too much. Andrew, you've already opened my eyes to a new way of thinking. I never thought about business or money this way. Andrew, you've already taught me so much. I already have had all the value I deserve for this course. You should stop it right here. I know, I know, but I'm fucking generous. So you're gonna do it again. 50 more points, 50 more lessons. Pay attention. First, 51. Why are you running your business? Genuine question. As a hustler, why are you running your business? I'm pausing so you can think about it. If you don't know the answer, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is for money. That's why you run your business. People will come to you all the time and say, start a business you're passionate about. Bullshit. You're only passionate about one thing, cash. It doesn't matter if you sell rocks, it doesn't matter if you sell jellyfish scrotums, who gives a shit? It doesn't matter what you sell, it matters that it sells. Sell what sells and get rich. Be passionate for profit. Most people come to me and go, oh, I need to start a business I'm, I know about and I'm passionate about. No, you don't. I could sell a makeup brand today. I don't know anything about makeup. But I know with my business acumen, the lessons I've already taught, the way I'd start the company bringing money in before I put money out, the way that I'd move quickly, the way I know I'd make money. I'd make money with a makeup brand. Fact. Fact. And I don't know anything about makeup, never wore it in my life. I ain't got fucking clue. You don't need to know about things to sell things. You need to know about selling to sell things. The idea that you need to be passionate about the business to make money from it is complete airy-fairy bullshit that idiots say. You are passionate only about what's making you money. You are passionate for profit. You're not passionate about product. So if you can make money selling concrete, let me tell you something. There's some Chinese billionaire out there, B, not M, B, who's selling rocks and concrete and making billions. Do you think he's passionate about concrete? Do you think he's fucking making love to concrete, kissing it late at night, hugging it in bed? I think he's got a fucking concrete doll and he's made a little hole for his dick. No, he doesn't give a fuck about concrete. He gives a fuck about money, as should you. Drop that I need to be passionate garbage. Passionate for profit only. 52, this is specifically for you social media markers. War is profitable, but not always. So I get this a lot. I see a lot of people who have digital products constantly in battles with other people in the space trying to get attention through war to try and sell products. War Online is very much like real war and you need to sit and plan and strategize if it's worthwhile. What are your end goals? What are your end objectives? How are you going to achieve them? Is your end goal and objective just to get people paying attention to your tweets? Is your end goal and objective to sell products? Is your end goal and objective to defame and to devalue the, uh, the status of your opponent? What is the end goal and objective? War can be profitable, but you need to make sure it is worthwhile. You shouldn't be arguing with small accounts people who are smaller than you. I will only beef with someone if they have more than 10,000 followers. Know your place, know their place. War can be profitable, but you need a strategy for war. So when I went to war with the Star Wars guys, let's show the Star Wars tweets again. My strategy was clear. Who likes Star Wars? Guys. If you meet a hot girl, she doesn't like Star Wars. Really, they don't care. Who's passionate about Star Wars? Guys. What kind of guys? Dorks. What do dorks need? Well, dorks usually have some money because they're dorks, but they don't have any girls. So if you will go through my Star Wars thread, you will see my strategy is simple for war. Sell my PhD course. Sell the ability to get girls. Show lots of girls. Sell the ability to how to obtain females. That was my strategy for that battle. And it worked fantastically well. That weekend, I sold a lot of PhD courses. I think I did like 15,000 or something. All basically off the fact that I said Star Wars was bullshit. I had a clear objective for my battle. Most people will go viral or they'll go battle and they haven't got a clear objective. They don't know what they're trying to do. I knew exactly what I was trying to do. Poke the geeks, annoy the geeks, annoy the nerds, and then, and then off the back of it, be humorous enough for them to entertain the idea of learning from me how to get girls. That made me money. War needs strategy. So if you're going to go to war in any way, either in the physical world or the internet reality, 
You need to be prepared and you're not prepared without strategy. So war is only profitable if you have a strategy, have a clear end goal, have a clear objective. Don't end up like America stuck in the Middle East in forever endless, pointless, nothing wars. That's what most people online are doing, constantly jabbing at each other for no reason. It's pathetic. I don't go to war often. If I go to war, it's going to pay me. I don't lose money to go to war. War is profitable, but only if you do it right. Keep that in mind. 53. Another thing that sells. We already talked about predicting the future and preempting the future. Presume the sale by talking about the future. Do you know what else makes people buy things? FOMO. Fear of missing out. I know you know this already. You're thinking, Tate, I already know that. Mm. How do you instill FOMO? Well, here's how most of you guys instill FOMO. If you don't buy now, we're closing and you won't be able to buy. No one cares because we know that that's a lie and we know that you're just closing it artificially to try and make some artificial deadline. So no one cares. How do I instill FOMO? I talk about how many other people have already bought it. All these people over here know what I know. You don't know shit. Talk about other people buying your product and it will make people want to buy your product because they'll feel like they missed out. So with television advertising, I used to do this all the time. Constantly talk about other campaigns or other clients I had. Not in a braggy way. Just in a, when I'm doing business with this, da, 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 or I did this campaign for this, da, 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 or this actually a very busy time of year for us right now. We have 15 people sign up in the last two weeks. We're really busy. Lots of people are doing this. Everyone's involved. People are doing this. People are doing this. People are doing this. Oh, I don't want to miss out if everyone else is doing it. Maybe everyone else thought it was a good idea. Well, why don't I think it's a good idea? Well, I don't like this and that, but, but everyone else likes it. So, uh, okay. Every, every, even, even successful people are herd mentality. Even very successful people are sheep. If they think everyone else is doing it, they're going to do it. It's the same with fashion trends. How many stupid fucking dumb pieces of clothing have you seen people wearing? But everyone else is wearing it. People need to know that lots of other people are buying. You need to make, find a way to make that clear. Lots of people are buying. Lots of people are doing this. You're the one who's not doing it. So with this university... I told the truth. I've been very, very impressed with how many signups I've had. I've not lied. I didn't need to because I've had lots of signups. But lots of people are learning all of my secrets to making money. You don't know. That person has FOMO now. I don't need to say I'm closing the uni. I need to say, look, these fuckers know a whole bunch of stuff you don't know. I did this all the time with advertising. It was fantastic with advertising. This is a really busy time of year for us. I used to say this, you know what? Any time of year, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, didn't matter. Do you know what I used to say? I say, this is a really busy time of year for us because people are gearing up for Christmas. They'd be like, Christmas? It's March. I'd be like, yeah, exactly. People are preparing already for the Christmas rush. It's March. So now they're sitting there going, it's March. We haven't even thought about Christmas yet. All these other businesses are thinking about Christmas. They're thinking about doing adverts at Christmas. It's March. We haven't even thought about Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yo, shit. Oh, shit. Christmas. Shit. Shit. I used to say that any time of year. December 1st or January 1st. I'd say January 1st, I used to say, when I used to go to meetings, I'd say, you know what's funny about January? They'd say, what? I'd say, we used to sign up, we sign up most of our Christmas advertising this month. They go, really? I go, yeah, yeah, we're preparing for Christmas in January. After Christmas, everyone's made a lot of money with TV advertising. People have made a lot of money in the campaigns we've already run. So now they're already preparing for the next campaigns at Christmas. So we're actually gearing up for Christmas right now. People will be sitting there going, oh, well, uh, maybe I need to do a campaign at Christmas. Other people are doing things. You're not doing anything. You are lazy. You are slow. Other people are ahead of you. Quickly, get on the train. The train's leaving. Quickly, get on. Quickly, pay the invoice. Yep, thanks. That's how you do it. I do it all the time with advertising. Talk about other people buying. It sells. Always talk about other people buying. Super important because it sells. Because it, one, instills some confidence in them that you're a real person, a real company. Two, it, it allows their thinking to be checked. Well, I think it's a good idea. And all these other people think it's a good idea, so it must be a good idea. So on my website, you'll notice on cobratape.com, I have something called social proof. I pay money to have that thing in the bottom that tells people every time someone buys from my website. So when you go on my website, you see other people are learning. You're not learning, but other people are. FOMO, super important. You can apply this to nearly any other company, any other business. Other people need to buy, super important. 54, chaos and opportunity. I once got told, that chaos and opportunity are the same word in Japanese. I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to say it. Chaos and opportunity are the same word in Japanese. In other words, every cloud has a silver lining. 
Every time stuff's fucked up, every time there's chaos, every time there's a mess, there is an opportunity, a huge opportunity. And you have to find a way to identify it one way or another. That's all it is. There's always a way to identify. So what's a chaos? What's a fuck up? I don't know. Off the top of my head, it doesn't matter what it is. The point is you are already applied speed to fix it, but you need to find a way to twist it in your favor. There's always a way to twist it in your favor. So it doesn't matter what it is. It, let's say your back end isn't done properly. Your back end is missing a bunch of vital information. Let's say, okay, cool. So you need a whole bunch of orders. You need something, you need people to fill in some information to fill in the back end. Then you hit up all your customers with a ridiculous deal. 99 cents for our face cream. Usually 10.99, 99 cents if you buy with any other product. Some ridiculous fucking deal. Even if it's a break even. What do you get? You get a whole bunch of orders, fills in your back end, your back end's back. Even if you just broke even on it, you filled in your back end, you've got some more loyal customers who are more prepared and more used to spending money on your website. Bang, done. There's always an opportunity. Doesn't matter how fucked up things go wrong, there's always an opportunity somewhere you just need to find it. Got to sniff it out. Something's gone. There must be some way here I can make some money. And everything has to feed back to remember the money in. That's important. Chaos and opportunity are the same thing. Especially, that's chaos within your business. If there's chaos within your market, it's even better. So, I don't know. Let's say, okay, off the top of my head. 9-11. Why that came to my head, I don't know. 9-11 fucked up the airline industry. All the planes got grounded. No one could fly. Huge lines at the airports. Da, da, da. Chaos. There's chaos within the industry. So, where's the opportunity? This is all off the top of my head. If I was an airline executive boss, I'd be going, okay, from now on when we sell tickets, we're gonna sell it with an added option for insurance for refunds in the event of a terror attack or an unpredictable event. We're gonna contact a big insurance company, we're gonna get them to insure us, we don't have to really do anything, we'll get them to insure us and we'll sell the insurance packages on top at a premium and make some extra money. Because now people are, who've been stuck in the airport for four days, next time they book a flight, they're gonna be like, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna pay for that insurance. I remember last time it was a nightmare. If I pay for this, I get all my money back and they'll, and they'll book me a hotel. Bang. Chaos in the industry. Opportunity to make more money. This come to me off the top of my fucking head. Where else was there a huge chaos in an industry? Can you think of chaos in an industry? It happens now and again. Now and again, things really go wrong. So, uh, fuck knows. But it happens all the time on smaller levels. And when there's chaos within a specialized industry, you need to find a way to monetize it, like I just did there with 9-11 and the airlines. Because there's always a way to monetize chaos. So when things go wrong, it happens. So like uh, the YouTube apocalypse, for example. Everything went super, super wrong with uh, all the YouTubers were making loads and loads of money off advertising and then the adpocalypse happened, they weren't making money off advertising anymore. So let's say that I'm a YouTuber and I see this has happened, there's huge chaos in the industry, no one's making money off advertising anymore. Do you know what you do? Well, I'd go, okay, well, that means I need to sell merchandise. So I'd contact all the other big YouTubers and say, hey, I've got a really good link for merchandise if you're interested in selling merch. I'd start a fucking merch company. Or I'd get a link with a merch company for commission. It's not complicated. So let's look at the adpocalypse. Everyone, I don't know if you know what happened. Everyone had all these big YouTube channels. They're making loads and loads and loads of money. Overnight, that all goes down to zero. Now they've still got viewerships, but they've got no money. So how do they make money from there? Well, they all decide to start selling merchandise, but they don't have any merchandise set up or, or worked out. Me as a big YouTuber, I contact a merchandise company, explain the apocalypse, explain what happened, explain I want to produce my own merchandise, and explain that I know 10 other big YouTubers who are going to go to another merchandise company, but I'm going to bring them to you if you'll give me a cut of how much money they bring you. And now anyone in their right mind will go, well, okay, get on the phone, old school. Yeah. I know 10 other YouTubers who I've met with and I work with, blah, blah, blah. They were going to use this merch website. Just Google another one. And I'm saying that I want to use you, but if I bring them all to you, I want 5% of their turnover. They'll agree? Bang. Now, from the chaos in the industry, you've become the fucking shark of merch. Now you're making money off all of their YouTube channels with one phone call by just being a G. Now every time Jackass 1 and Jackass 2 sells a hat, you get paid. Before, you didn't get none of their money. You just knew them. Now all you have to do is call them up and say, bro, Adpocalypse is bullshit, but I know a fucking awesome company that's gonna sell us merch and we're gonna sell merch and make money. Bang. 
Chaos in the industry is an opportunity every time if you think like me, if you think like a hustler. This is setting up a company, a revenue stream, it costs you nothing. There's no outlay to this. This is just a phone call and a hustler's mindset. Bang, you got paid. Chaos is opportunity, find it every time. 55, we're at 55 now. You should have learned a whole bunch of shit already, but we've got more coming. 55, right, remember what I said to you earlier, that you cannot make money, you can only take money. This is super important, this is lesson number 55. You have to learn to view all of your offers from your buyer's eyes. And you have to understand why that's so important. The Federal Reserve can make money, they can print money. You can't. There's only one way you're gonna make money. I'm gonna give you a demonstration of how that happens. This is Mr. Customer. This is his money. This is you. He gives it to you. Beautiful, very complicated, I know. That is how you make money. You don't print money, you don't generate money. You make money because people decide to give it to you. So, you have to learn how to view your offer very, very specifically from your buyer's eyes. This is point number 55. So your offer is whatever. I am the best surgeon, masseuse, who the fuck knows, blah, blah, blah. You have to, you're thinking of it from your point of view. Oh, I see this all the time with people. Oh, but people are gonna come do business with us because our oil is the best, our massage oil is the best. Does he know anything about massage oil? Does he even give a fuck? Has he tried bad massage oil? Does he know the difference, has he felt the difference between good and bad massage oil? Like, like, you think, I see this all the time with people, they think nitpicking tiny little details is gonna make the money. I took, I took massage completely at random, but let's use this as an example. You have a massage company. That's supposed to say massage. You think, oh, we use the best massage oil, that's why we're the most expensive and people are gonna to come to us. If you actually, instead of being a fucking dork, like most people who run their businesses are, here you're a geek and you're a massage oil geek. It doesn't matter if you're a programmer geek or a mechanic geek or whatever your business is, a drop shipping geek, anything, it doesn't matter. You'd understand that from the buyer's perspective, they don't give a fuck about mass massage oil. They don't know the difference in different kinds of massage oil. And they don't even know how, they don't even know the benefit of using a good massage oil. They've never used a bad massage oil. They don't know how bad a bad massage oil is. To them, oil's oil. So there, you're not viewing the pro things. You're not viewing the offer from the eyes of the consumer. You're viewing the offer from the eyes of you, a knowledgeable nerd. Most consumers are not knowledgeable, especially on what you're trying to sell them. They don't know anything. You have to view it from their eyes. If you view it from their eyes, you'd understand they don't give a fuck about massage oil. So then your choices are as follows. Either you educate them on massage oil, you incorporate that into your advertising and teach them and explain to them why it's better, or you fuck it off and get something cheaper and save money. Those are the two genuine options. Always look from your buyer's eyes. Why is your buyer gonna give you money? And do this intricately, like do it down to the, the tiny details. Doesn't matter, we'll go back to a coffee shop. Why are they gonna come get coffee with me? Because my chairs are comfortable, because my building looks warm. I use those, uh, the same lights we have in here, Edison bulbs to make it look warm. My staff, I've got a couple cute girls there. My cups are, are cool, I got, I got colored cups. It doesn't matter, you need to think of everything. Why would someone walk past my coffee shop and go, yeah, I actually do want coffee. You have to think on it at that level. For every single product you sell, why you and not someone else? Because there's always someone else selling. So you're viewing yourself from the buyer's eyes. While you're doing that, you can view your competition from the buyer's eyes. So if you do it in this example, this is the competition. He uses cheap massage oil, but he's cheaper than you. So from the buyer's eyes, he's like, okay, masseuse, masseuse, he's 20 bucks cheaper. Massage is a massage. I'll just go with him first. They'll go with the cheap guy first, and unless it's absolutely awful, they're not likely to upgrade. Now I've said many times, don't sell on price. So I'm not saying you should try and outprice your competition. My point is, if he is viewing two of you and the only difference he can identify is the cost, why would he buy the most expensive one? So you need to understand here, okay, I have an important job. My job, now it looks like a dick. So you're a dick. You're a dick. My job here is to identify my USP, which is the expensive massage oil, and educate my consumers as to why they should use it. 
So every time someone calls you on any poster, anything like that, you need to be saying guaranteed no skin irritation or guaranteed, or, uh, guaranteed best uh, results for acne. I don't fucking know. Best results for uh, eczema, whatever. Anything to make people go, oh, why is that guaranteed what? And you can explain to them, oh, we actually use this kind of oil. Other people use cheap oil from China. We don't use that. We use oil which is hand-pressed by beautiful virgins in the Italian mountains, blah, 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 blah. View yourself from your buyer's eyes. Otherwise, you end up like this, like a dick. And think about that seriously. You can do this on so many levels. So it doesn't matter what product you have. doesn't matter what you're selling. View yourself from the buyer. Identify why they're going to do business with you above, to, above someone else. And never assume the buyer has knowledge. This happens all the time where people go, oh, but actually my company does this and my company does that. And, and I sit there and I go, yeah, but no one knows that. And no one cares. You think that matters. It doesn't matter. You think that matters. It doesn't matter at all. You need to educate the buyer why that matters, otherwise they don't give a fuck. View yourself from the buyer's eyes. Do not view yourself from your own knowledgeable eyes. And this feeds perfectly into lesson number 56. If you want an unbiased opinion from a general consumer on your company, I'll tell you who you get it from. Number 56. Let me clear my board quickly because having the dick behind me is a bit weird. We've all identified your dicks. Number 56, ask your mother about your company. Doesn't matter what company you want to launch, go and ask your mother about it. I'll tell you why. Your mother is, very, is going to be very indicative of a typical consumer. She isn't going to know a lot about what you're trying to do. She isn't going to know a lot about technical stuff. She isn't really going to understand a lot of the things you say. I'm talking about my mother anyway. My mother's an idiot. And I mean that with all due respect because she's a nice lady, but she's just stupid. My dad was a smart one. So... They ain't going to know a whole bunch. And two, your mother's never going to bullshit you. So if you have an idea for a company, let's say you want to fucking, I don't know, sell, okay, you're a masseuse. And you go to your mom, hey, I'm going to open a massage company. Really? You're going to open a massage company? Why? Well, I think I can make money making massages. Well, how much is it going to cost? This much. That's expensive for a massage. If that's the first thing she says, you've got a problem. No, it's not expensive because we use the best massage oil. Well, what's the difference in massage oil? It's all the same, isn't it? Bang. Your mother is going to give you the best market research you're ever going to have in your life. Now, if you're selling something super specialized and your mom may not understand, then maybe, I don't know, maybe a little bit more difficult. But for anything basically normal, you should ask your mom about your company because she's going to identify all of your problems straight away. That conversation, I just imaginary conversation I just have with my mom, she identified that I'm coming across as expensive and that no one gives a fuck about massage oil. Bang, there's your problems identified. Your mom's never going to bullshit you. She's always going to be straight to the point and explain to you exactly what your issues are and what needs to be solved. Any company you're launching, you need to show to and speak to your mom about because she's going to cut the bullshit faster than anyone. Please remember, your average typical consumer is not an educated person because most average people in the world are not educated people. They don't have much knowledge of anything and they certainly don't have knowledge of your particular subject and they don't have specialist knowledge of your subject. I don't know about you. I mean, I'm a professional fighter. I've been getting massages where I've been training hard for many, many years. When I walk into a uh, massage parlor and they say, do you want sports massage, Swedish massage, this massage, that massage, I, don't, I still don't know the difference. I don't know. They're all the same, aren't they? I don't know. All I just go, oh, uh, okay, this one. So I don't even know about massages. And I've probably had more massages than most people. And this is my point exactly. Your consumer is not educated. So ed you need to educate them and, and then make them understand why you're charging more. Or you need to remove that barrier. So when I just gave that conversation with the mom there, with the massage oil. She's already identified as expensive. She's identified no one gives a shit about massage oil. Your mom is going to tell you what ideas are good and what aren't, and she's never, ever going to bullshit you. But you know why? Because your mother wants you to be successful. Your mother does not want you wasting your time on some company that's never going to pay you. Your mother wants you to do well. So any idea you have, go to your mom and say, do you, what do you think of this company? See what she says. And then if she sits there and she says only good things, say, well, would you buy from me? No, because I don't want that. Why don't you want it? Oh, I don't know. I don't start writing down all the reasons she wouldn't buy from you. Why doesn't she want it? Why wouldn't she buy from you? Work out how to overcome all of these things. You're going to get a whole bunch of information. So you're speaking to your mom, ask her, have a general conversation about the company and then ask her why she would or wouldn't buy from you and make sure you write that information down. If she says, I would buy from you because X, Y, Z. Good. Those are your points you need to press home in all your advertising. So she wouldn't buy from you because of X, Y, Z. You need to go, okay, how do I solve? How do I overcome these? Why wouldn't you buy a massage from me, mom? I don't have time. Oh, we have mobile masseuses though. We come around, we'll come to your house if you haven't got time. 
oh yeah, but you know, uh, well, how do I book it? We'll put a flyer through your door and you can just book by text message. Mm, okay, like anything to overcome, find out what her problems are and overcome them. So you have to speak to your mom about every single company. This is super important because it's the best market research you're gonna get. If you can do your market research in advance before you launch your company, that's less time you're gonna spend fucking up and more time you're gonna spend making money. So every single company I launch, I speak to my mom about it. So even when I launched my PhD course, I said to my mom, I'm gonna launch a course telling guys how to get girls. And she said, oh, don't make more men like you out there. That's what she said. I was like, what do you mean like me? She goes, oh, well, the way you are with women. And I sat there and I thought, okay, bang, I know this is gonna work. Because even my mom knows I'm pimping hoes. <laughs> even my mom knows, she's seen so many chicks coming out the door, even my mom's like, all right, I don't know what kind of son I've raised, but he's, he's tearing through these chicks dangerously. So with the PhD course, I knew it would be a fantastic idea. Because even my mom was saying to me, look, you're gonna make some dangerous men out there. So every single business I've ever run by my mom, all of them. And sometimes she said some pretty smart shit. There's a level, you know what? There is, there is a level of intelligence which comes from absolute stupidity. So like smart and stupid is a circle. So you have smart at the top and you have stupid at the bottom. And you have this circle. And let's say this is the smart side and this is the stupid side. So it's, just, it's in half. This is stupid. I know this is written bad. And this is smart. But sometimes you can get comments which, just, which are just on the edge, you know? And moms are great at this. So like, I, like I, I bought my new Lamborghini and I drove to my mom's house. I said, mom, I bought a new car. What do you think? She goes, what is that? I said, it's a Lamborghini. She goes, how much was it? I said, oh, it was 300 grand. She goes, three, you spent 300 grand on a car? I was like, yeah. She goes, let me see. So she comes out and she says something that was so smart. It was actually, you know, it was so stupid. It, it circled back around to smart. She looked at my Lamborghini and goes, why would you spend 300,000 on something that only has two seats? As in, it should have more seats because it costs more money. So I should have got a bus for my money, I guess. That's her logic. Her logic is, why would you, it's only got two seats, so it's shit. Which is stupid, but it kind of gets into the smart realm. It's kind of, you know, you get a lot of these kind of comments from mothers. They say things which are kind of dumb, but kind of smart. And if you can extract those comments and apply them to your company, you'll fix a lot of problems in advance. So that's why speaking to your mom is so important. Next. Key point, 57. And this is very, very important. I'm going to tell you a story with this one. Money will never motivate your staff. Never. And I'll tell you why. Money is numbers. And numbers never end. Which means if you're going to try to motivate people with money, it's going to get hard. If someone doesn't like the job and doesn't like you and doesn't like anything about how they're treated in the job or how they feel or what they do, you have to pay them a lot of money to make them do it. A lot of money. And that is not very, very cost effective. If somebody enjoys what they do and they feel part of a community and they like it, then you don't have to pay them much at all. And the proof I'll give of that, I just spat my coffee, I'm just saying proof sent my coffee everywhere, is that people do shit for sense of community all the time. Remember after T2 Television, I started Vixels, my own company, to sell television advertising. So what happened is I found an office in Luton that was 400 pounds a month, and I decided I was gonna become a millionaire with television advertising. So I found out, got a 400 pound office. Me and Tristan would uh, sit there, and then we advertised for salesmen, commission only. So it was a commission only position. You sent emails all day long, just emailing market managers all day, all day, just copy and pasting, just emailing anyone you could find on the internet, emailing all day long. If they replied to you, there'd be a phone call. I'd do the phone call. So T2 was all phone pitching. And that's why it took a long time for us to train our staff. Every single day we were doing two hours of training, phone pitching about television advertising. Phone pitching, phone pitching, phone pitching. And T2 made money. But training people to be good on the phones is hard and a lot of people are scared to do cold calls well. And people are lazy with cold calls. So me and Tristan had the idea, you know what, we're gonna email blast anyone we can find. We'll buy all the magazines, email every marketing manager. We'll go through all of the websites we can find. We'd Google up things like Store Locator. If you type Store Locator into Google, you have all the companies that have a Store Locator. So these are companies with multiple branches, so television advertising will suit them because it's, they're across, they're, nation, they're national. Email, email, email. If any, any market manager emailed back, I'd do the call because I'm trained on the phone. So Vixels was different. T2, everyone pitched on their own. Vixels is just emails out. So we, we put adverts out there for a position, which was commission only. So no basic. Every deal you landed, you got 5%. So if you landed a 20 grand deal, 
on TV, you get a thousand pounds. So if you landed two a month, you get two grand a month. Ain't gonna make you rich, but whatever. And we were hiring basically anyone, like dorks. It doesn't matter. Like we had one guy who had a criminal record. We had one dude who was just a bit of a weirdo, some fat guy. We had some other guy who de definitely drunk too much because he stunk a booze. But who cares? They're coming in. They're sending the emails. And then someone emailed back. I'd call them. Over time, as people came and quit and didn't land any deals, we ended up with quite a good little team of four guys plus me and Tristan. So six guys who were in this office. Now, these guys were working hard. They were emailing like machines because you can't get a machine to email because you got to go to the websites, find their email marketing manager's name. You can buy email marketing manager lists, but they never worked because it changes so often. It's bullshit. So we had to go and manually find and manually type it in. And da, da, da. So these guys are emailing, 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 emailing. Anyway, most of the guys I had there for the first solid month didn't make a fucking penny. I had free staff for a month. I had, four, I had four guys plus me and Tristan and they're working their asses off for free. How did I motivate them? Every day I'd come in, positive energy, come in full of energy. Guys, today's the day we're gonna make it, da da da. Oh, the, your guy emailed back, oh, I'm calling him later, that's a deal, that's definitely a deal, I've been doing this a long time, might take a few weeks, but that's gonna be a deal, da 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 da. And I'd order pizza. Every day I'd order pizza, we'd sit around, we'd eat our pizza in the office, I'd talk about the big dreams of how T2 was such a big company, how Vixel was gonna be bigger. I'd sell a dream and they'd eat pizza and everything was fine. So for a $10 pizza every day, I had four members of full-time staff. Now, none of these men were motivated by money. They were motivated by my energy, the dreams of the future. They weren't getting paid anything. They may have been motivated by the future prospect of money, but I hadn't offered them any money to turn up and they were on time every single day. You do not need money to motivate your staff. If your staff respect you and they know where you're going and things are going and are gonna go well, then you don't need money to motivate them. I actually fucked up big here because what happened with this company is I accepted a fight and I decided to go training in Slovakia. And when I went away, Tristan came with me, we went away for 10 days. And in the 10 days, me and Tristan didn't turn up in the office, all the men quit, every single one. And that was the end of Vixels. The whole business fell apart. And that's because we weren't there. The leaders had abandoned ship. They felt there's no leadership energy in the office. There's no one buying pizza. Why am I coming here every day for free? All of a sudden it dawns on them and they leave. But the point I'm trying to make with this story is number 57 is that money will never motivate your staff. There's better ways to motivate your staff. Obviously pay your staff well. Obviously if they need money, give them money. I'm not saying you can get them all to work for free. My point is I see loads of people who go, I'll start a company and I'm going to pay my guys the most. And I saw this with a fight promotion. So there's a fight promotion that come along and goes, I'm gonna launch the biggest fight promotion. Uh, some guys I know with money, big money as well. We wanna launch a kick, they came to me. We wanna launch a kickboxing promotion, we wanna be the biggest. So how are you gonna be the biggest? We're gonna pay all the fighters the biggest money, the most money. So they all wanna fight for us. Get the best fighters. Sounds like a good idea, especially fighters because most fighters are broke. The problem is they didn't end up getting the best fighters because they didn't have good exposure, they didn't have good cameras, they didn't, uh, have good social media platforms. So a lot of the fighters were choosing to fight other places because of the prestige they got for winning as opposed to this organization no one's heard of and a couple extra hundred. Money doesn't motivate. There's far better ways to motivate than money in life. So don't be thinking you need to pay your staff loads of money to make them loyal to you. That's complete bullshit at all. That's not true at all. Get that out of your head. Money doesn't motivate. 58, success is exponential. When you've done something once, it's much quicker to do it again. It's the same with anything. You'll say you start driving, you parallel park once, it takes forever. Eventually you get good at parallel parking, it's quick. It's exactly the same with success. Success is ex exponential. As you've done things, it becomes quicker to do things. It takes a long time to make a million. It's easier to make a second million. It's even easier to make a third. It's easier to make a fourth because you understand mechanisms. So starting from the very, very bottom, if you can stay motivated and work hard when you have nothing, you're in the hardest part. It does get easier. The problems change. As you get bigger and become a bigger company, you have new kinds of problems. You may have legal problems or fulfillment issues or all these other problems, but you won't be broke anymore, at least. I believe business gets easier. It starts hard, H for hard, and gets easier. If you can stick it out here, you'll enjoy this. Most people quit here. 99% of people quit when it's hard, and that's why the 1% is the 1%. It's exponential. First time you make a website, you have to go out there, you have to source all these different companies, or you have to find a member of staff to make it, and you make it, and you make mistakes, and you need to change it because the SEO ain't set up, blah, blah, whatever. The third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time you make a website, you can do it very, very quickly. And you can do it properly the first time without mistakes. So success is exponential. Keep that in mind that anything that seems to be like taking forever now, 
Remember lesson one, speed, 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 speed. We're gonna get better at it, you're gonna get faster at it, and soon things are gonna blow up quickly. I launch companies every day. I can launch a company, I can launch a new company a day. I've got to that point now. I know my people, my staff are good. I can say, James, do this, Dylan, do this, Luke, do this, Tristan, do this, you do this, you do that, you do this, I'll do this, bang, and within six hours, everything's done. I'm at that point now. But that's come from so much success previously, it's exponential, it builds up. Just keep that in mind. Now, 59. This is a really important lesson, super important. And I'm assuming this is gonna to apply to some of you who are watching this. 59, nobody is broke. Let me get rid of this. Nobody is broke. They're simply just buying other stuff. They're buying other things. People go, I can't afford it. That means, well, I can afford it, but I decided I need something else more. Broke people are not broke. They just want something else more than they want your offer. Your offer has to be more important than food. So what you offer, whatever it is, what did we selling flux capacitors? How did I draw a flux capacitor? It was like this, wasn't it? Food. No matter what it is, it has to be more important than food. Because when broke people say they can't afford it, unless they're literally crackheads on the street, which is quite rare, they're still buying food, and they're probably still buying paying for their car, paying for their rent, they're going out at the weekend with their friends, they're still socializing, they're still paying for that ski trip next month. So they're paying for plenty of stuff. They're just not paying for what you've got. So no one's broke. They just decide that other things are more important than what you offer. So how do you get around that? Well, you have to make sure your offer is always geared as more important. So let me ask you, some of you guys who bought Hustlers University, it wasn't too big a deal for you. You're sitting on some money, you got some savings, or you're in my Forex program, you're already making lots of money with Forex, and you thought, fuck it, all right, I'll buy Hustle University. Some of you guys who bought this, literally it was all your money. But you thought, I need this. I don't need to go out and club. I don't need to, I need Hustlers University instead. So I convinced you, and you made the right decision. I didn't convince you in a negative way, I convinced you in the correct way, because you made a very smart decision. But I convinced you that my knowledge and this course is more important than going to the club or eat in an expensive restaurant or some dumb shit. I convinced you of that. So nobody is broke, they're just buying other things. Get out of your head the idea that people can't afford things. They can't afford it, they just don't want it enough. Because if they wanted it, they'd buy it. Because they're buying a whole bunch of other shit. Everyone is, everyone is spending money every day. They're buying other things. So how do you convince people your offer is worth more than something as basic as food? Well, that's very, very simple. You just promise it's gonna lead to more food later. Done. So, and that's the truth of Hustlers University. So why is Hustlers University worth more than anything else you could do? Because if you listen to the advice in here and start your own business, you can do that shit later more. It's exactly the point. So let's say you sell flux capacitors and you say to somebody, buy one. Can't afford it. Yeah, you can. No, I can't. I can't. I've got to pay my rent, blah, 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 blah. You say, well, if you buy a flux capacitor, your rent's going to reduce. So in the long run, you're not going to pay as much rent, for example. Or if you buy a flux capacitor, you're going to have more food. Or you're going to make more money so you can buy more food or you're gonna have your own farm. Who gives a shit what? Find a way to get around people's objections so that they understand that buying your product is more important than doing any of the other dumb shit they do. Nobody is poor. Everybody's a customer and everybody has some money. Everybody. You have to get around it. So let's say you're selling, fuck it, I don't know. There's a dude in the war room right now who's just launched his own company. He's selling uh, gas and oil supplies. I don't know anything about gas and oil supplies. I also don't know how he sells. I don't know his particular selling tactic. However, I'm sure he makes it very, very clear to people when he tries to sell them a new pipe. You need this new pipe. That's my drawing of a pipe. It's a square. It's beautiful. You need this new pipe. I can't afford it. But if you buy this new pipe, you're gonna save money. You can't afford to not have it because you're gonna save money if you buy it. So you, if your problem is money, then you really need this pipe. Bang, flipped on him. Your problem's money. Well, you told me you have no money. Well, now you need the pipe, otherwise you're gonna never have money. Now the pipe's more important than saving money. Go buy the pipe. You have to make everyone understand that your offer is more important than anything else they can possibly buy. If they put something else above it, more important, like food, air, water, promise them more food, air, and water if they buy your product. Nobody is broke. They just need to want it. And you have to make people want it. That is your goal. So get out of your idea, oh, right now, I hear all the time from business owners, oh, it's a slow period right now, why? Oh, the recession, or people ain't got much money right now. Complete garbage, complete bullshit. You know what, I ran cam girls in the height of the recession. When all these businesses were going out of business, 
because of the recession. There was dudes sending me millions of dollars while jerking off. Do you know why? Because they really wanted to see some titties while they jerked off. They wanted it. They wanted titties more than they wanted anything else. So why are some businesses recession proof? Why you think during a recession, things like gambling, things like smoking, drinking, cam girls, you think vices would disappear. Oh, it's a recession. We have to cut back all the dumb shit and focus on the necessities. Why does that not happen? Why does the dumb shit grow? Because people go, oh, okay, it's a recession. I'm going to save my money. And they start being tight and being stupid about other things, but they still can't control their vices and they end up blowing more money on their vices. Because with vices, people want it. And this proves my point absolutely. Even during an international recession, people are not broke. You just have to make them want what you have. Get that out of your head that people are broke. It's completely untrue. You just have to make your offer more appealing than anything else they can possibly spend their money on. And they'll buy your offer. And you do that by either promising more of something else or positioning yourself above something else. Very, very easy. Next. Nothing ever fixed itself. Point 60. Let me wipe my board quickly. Point 60. Nothing ever fixes itself. This is the same with anything inside of any company and we're all adults and we should know this. So you're an adult. When's the last time your car broke down and you did nothing about it and it fixed itself? When's the last time you had a flat tire and instead of going to the mechanic, you came out a few months later and the tire was fixed? Never. Nothing fixes itself. If you have a problem inside of your company or a problem making money, you better do something about it quickly. I see people come along and go, oh yeah, it's been a few slow couple of months. I'm like, okay, so what have you been doing? Oh, you know, well, it's been a slow couple of months. We're going to place some more adverts. Wait, it's been months of slow, and now you're thinking of placing adverts. After the second slow day, I would have been in a panic. I'd be like, whoa, what the fuck's going on? It's been two days. Where's the fucking money? Oh, but sometimes it can vary from day to day. Nah, don't buy it. Change something now. Speed. You, nothing is ever going to fix itself in any, in any company. Same with all your tech stuff. PayPal or fucking your... your hosting. I, I know like I get one guy I work with, James, he calls, he thinks I'm super impatient. If you wait around for other people to just fix things, it never happens. I've had it a million times. The number of times I've been waiting on PayPal thinking, oh yeah, it's going to be fine. It, it just never happens. You have to hound everyone to the end of the earth. I've been in business a very, very long time and I cannot think of a single example where I thought, hmm, I'm not going to chase or hound or annoy this person and it's going to work out fine. It's never happened. You have to be constantly on the phone six times a day. You have to be beefing people nonstop. And there's a reason for that. It's because the people who work at these companies or the people who work for someone else, they don't give a fuck about you. They've got their own problems. Their girlfriend's cheating on them. They can't afford their rent. They hate their job. You think he's really thinking, oh, I really better get this online, this, this hosting online for that guy. No, they don't fucking care. Even if you call them, they're like, yeah, I understand, sir. It's a big problem. They don't care. They don't care. They've got their own lives. They don't give a shit. No one gives a shit about you. So nothing's ever gonna fix itself. So don't be afraid to be a hard ass with the technical things, that's the first thing. And second thing, if you've got a problem inside of your business and you've identified it, you need to start thinking of a battle plan to fix it quickly. It's not gonna go away without you doing something, just like the flat tire won't. If you have a lack of customers sitting there going, okay, well, we're still building the brand, we're still building the name, so let's see where we stand in a month. No, you've identified you have a lack of customers. What can you do about it now? Lesson one, speed. How can you fix that problem today. Even if you come up with a plan, and you, if you follow my other rules that you've learned so far, you can come up with a plan that costs no money, effectively. You come up with a plan and you implement it. Even if it doesn't work, you're still in the same position. What's the worst that can happen? So this is where Tristan and I sometimes have a little uh, disagreement. So let's say Tristan and I, when we were running the cam girls, uh, there'd be like three or four days which were really slow. And I'd say to Tristan, where the fuck's the money? He go, oh, it happens. There's a big football game. Guys are busy, blah, blah, blah. So now nah, I don't buy that. Nah, this girl needs a new account because her account score is low. This girl needs new costumes. This girl needs this. Da, da, da. We've got to change everything. And Tristan's like, it's been three days. Just chill. I'm like, nah, change everything. We need this. We need that. Her set has been the same for a year. Let's re, let's re wallpaper that wall, give her a different set. Let's change this. Let's change this. Da, da. So we'll do all those changes. Then two weeks later, money's rolling in. Tristan will go, well, money's rolling in now, but I don't know if it was, the, we don't know if it was the changes you made or if it was just the football game. The, cha- the money might have rolled in anyway. And we've gone through all that and we don't know why. I say, look, what I know is this, the money is now rolling in. The butterfly effect. I know that in the current reality, I did a bunch of things and now the money's appeared. 
You're saying that maybe if we didn't do those things, maybe the money would have come anyway. Well, I don't live in a maybe world. Nobody knows that. I know that there's two days, two, three slow days. I identified a problem. I took drastic action and I fixed it. Now it's fixed. You can try and pretend I didn't fix it and that it was going to happen anyway if you want. But things don't fix themselves. I know how the world works. And Tristan eventually will concede. So if things are slow for one or two days, I'll get in panic mode with my business. And I'll fucking start doing something. And that's when you have your best ideas when you're in panic mode. And as long as you can implement those ideas without spending a whole ton of money, good. I'm not saying panic, buy Google ads and blow a million. I'm saying sit there and go, okay, how can I get customers in right here, right now, speed? What can I do without spending money? All I did was buy some wallpaper, adjust some beds, make a new account that's free, tell the girl to change her lipsticks and bought her a $10 costume. I spent 20 bucks. Boom. Done. All the money started rolling in. And I know it's because of me. Tristan's going to, Tristan sometimes would be like, oh, well, maybe it would have happened anyway. Nah. Maybe, maybe. You live in a maybe world. I live in the real world. I did a whole bunch of shit. All the girls are busy now. I could have just sat there. Three days are quiet. Four days are quiet. One week is quiet. Two weeks is quiet. Yeah, it's a quiet period. Yeah. People aren't, it's it's hot outside. People don't want to sit on their computer. Yeah. And made excuses like a dickhead. Or I could have done things, action, speed, number one, fixed the problem and made some fucking money. That's the difference between me and even Tristan, who I've mentored on business. Because Tristan will be more like, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. It will never be fine unless you fix it. It's never going to be okay unless you do something. The customers are never going to come unless you bring them. They're never going to give you money unless you force them. Your website's never going to fix itself. Fucking PayPal is never going to email you and go, okay, we're working now. Your payment processor is never going to go, oh, okay, we'll update you next week and everything's going to be fine. No, nothing is ever going to be okay unless you take it into your own hands and fix it yourself. And any adult who's lived any kind of life knows that's true. When you leave things to other people, it doesn't get done. You know that. You already know that. So keep it in mind, especially with business. Two, three days of no customers, do something. Nothing fixes itself. That's super important. 61. Never, ever, ever, ever say no to money. Ever. 61. I can't believe I have to tell people this, but sometimes I do. Never say no to money. So my business card, we'll insert the video here. People ask me all the time about my business card and they take it off me and go, is this a joke? You mean joke, motherfucker, I ain't fucking joking. It's not a joke. I hand this out multi-million dollar business deals. This isn't a fucking joke. This is my business card. Take Enterprises Unlimited. Because there's no limits to what I can do. What, like a limited company. Oh, we were limited. There's certain things. We, there's nothing I can't fucking do. It's the whole point of the car. Kickboxing world champion. Also a millionaire and all around nice guy. Now most people probably know those facts, but I thought I might as well put them on the card anyway. Now when you flip the card to the back, there's a whole list of activities I can complete for a fee. And this is why people get the idea, the insinuation that I'm joking. Difficult done immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. Miracles by appointment. Wars fall. That's right, wars fall. You don't need to be higher no army. You, have you not seen Rambo? Only takes one dude who's pissed off. You can hire me. If you want to go to war, hire me, I'll get it done. Assassinations plotted. Revolutions started. Uprisings quelled. I can, quell, I can start a revolution or I can quell an uprising. Either way you want it done. I can do both. Dragon slaying, dragon comes along, call Big Daddy Tate. Jet charter, ventriloquist, sexual athlete, the list goes on and on. But the basis behind this card, the reason this card is important and it isn't a joke, is what I'm basically saying is, if you're prepared to pay me, I'm prepared to get it done. That's my basic business philosophy. Even if I don't know how to do it, that's not the problem. The problem is how much you're going to pay me. Someone comes along and goes, Andrew, I need you to build an oil rig in the most dangerous, rough seas where oil rigs can't be built. And I make up my price. I send them an invoice for $6.6 .6 billion. If they pay my invoice, I'll find a way to get it done. Maybe I have to hire someone else. Maybe I have to outsource it, whatever. But if you're prepared to pay me, there's no job I will not take if you're prepared to, take, to pay the fee. There's a dragon and no one can beat it. And it's, it's killing, it's destroying the whole city. Godzilla's here. Wire me the money, I'll get it done. It's my basic business philosophy. So I put some examples here which may seem a little bit extreme to you losers, but they're not extreme because they're proving a point. I dictate my prices. If you pay the invoice, 
regardless of what needs doing, I'm the man for the job. I'm currently building an army. I'm building an army in my war room. My war room is a dedicated group of like-minded individuals who are out here looking to get paid, looking to raise funds, looking to change their entire worldview. I've said in my other videos how important it is to only sit and talk about money. Well, in the war room, all we do is sit and talk about money and a few other things, but mainly money, besides the explicit pictures. But war room will be soon added to my new business cards, which are coming. I'm going to have some new ones made, and they're going to be embossed with real gold, worth about 6 or $7 each card. Give them out to girls in the club, throw my money away, you know how it is. But... The war room is the real deal. So if you're thinking you want a card as awesome as mine, don't worry about that. The first thing you do is get in the war room, get some soldiers, meet some like-minded individuals, and then you can worry about trying to be a G, like Big Daddy T. So you'll see the lesson in my business card is very, very simple. My business card is basically, I'll do anything if you pay me. You want me to tame crocodiles? You want me to overthrow a government? You want me to fucking lead a rebellion in a nation? You want me to become a pirate? I don't give a fuck. How much are you paying me? 2.2 bill? Okay, here's the bank details. You send me billions of dollars, I'll get it done. I don't care if I have to outsource it to someone else. I don't care if I have to fucking, I don't know what I'll do. If you want a rocket on the moon and you're gonna pay me billions of dollars, I will find a way to put a rocket on the moon. Pay me my price. My price may be too much. I may be overpriced, but if you decide to pay me and I have to go speak to Elon afterwards at some billionaire's party and say, bro, I need a rocket on the moon. Here's five bill. But you paid me six bill. I'll get it done. And this is the point. Never say no to money. I see companies all the time saying no to money. You don't realize even you say no to money. Oh, we don't take Bitcoin. Why? Oh, 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 we don't like it. It's still money. It's still some money. You may not like it. You may, not, you may prefer other forms of currency, but it's still money. There's someone out there who wants to pay in Bitcoin. You need to create a golden bridge for people to pay you money. It has to be very, very easy to give you money. So if you want to buy any of my services, you can buy in any currency in the world, you can buy in Bitcoin. If you don't want to buy through the website, you can send me a direct bank transfer. If you don't want, if you want to come meet me in person and give me cash, I've done this for war room members. Hey, I'm in Romania next week, can I give you cash? No problem, we'll meet up and have a coffee. I will take your money any way you want to send it. If you want to give me Iraqi dinars, fine. Let me check the exchange rate, bang, yeah. 18 million Iraqi dinars, please. If you want to give me Iraqi dinars, you want to give me gold bars. If you want to give me fucking laundry detergent, I don't give a fuck. If you have two trucks of laundry detergent worth $5,000 and you want to use that as payment, I'll take it. I may try and say, don't you have cash? No, I don't have cash. You got Bitcoin? No, I don't have Bitcoin. All I have is this detergent. Cool, bro. I'll take it. I will take your money. Never say no to money. Any way people want to give it to you, take it. Any way it's easiest for them, take it. This comes down to the whole legality thing. Remember what I said earlier, get rich before you get legal? This is important. I know loads of guys who are like, oh, we can't take cash because it's against the rules. Uh, uh, we can't take Bitcoin because the Federal Reserve uh, and the tax. Uh. You're not rich yet, bro. You're not a multimillionaire. You need to take everything you can fucking get. Worry about that bullshit later. Fuck the rules. Dude wants to give you laundry detergent and a gold bar and fucking a pile of South Korean won. Who gives a shit? He's paying. Take it. Take the money. Always take the money any way they're prepared to pay. Any way they're prepared to pay. Such a fucking mistake people make. Make it very, very easy to, for people to pay you because people can have loads and loads of unique ways of paying. So this happens a lot in Romania. So in Romania, when a company sponsors another company, they usually do it with stock. So let's look at my, my good friend, Sebastian. Anyone who knows me knows my good friend is Sebastian. He owns RXF. RXF is a cage fighting organization. So here's our cage. On the cage, you have the sponsors, which get to be all over TV. But the sponsors don't give him cash, they give him product. So one of the sponsors sells roof, roofing things. But they don't want to give Sebastian cash because this is Romania and it's just Romania works in a different way. So he goes, I don't want to give you cash, I'll give you roof tiles. So he's paying for his sponsorship in roof tiles. Sebastian goes, okay, cool, I'll take your roof tiles. Sebastian takes roof tiles. Then he has another boy he has who goes out and sells the roof tiles or he makes some phone calls about a bunch of roof tiles, who wants roof tiles? Old school for Moosin. But effectively, Sebastian doesn't go, no, I want money. Because then the sponsor will go, well, I don't want to give you money. I've got a bunch of roof tiles on my road. And then he'll lose a sponsor. Sebastian makes it very, very easy to do, to do business with him. If you'll pay me in roof tiles, lumber, fucking anything you want to give me, no problem. Just give it to me. 
And all you need from there is one or two other connects to shift the stuff. Because roof tiles are money. Because roof tiles are worth money. He gets $5,000 worth of roof tiles. He calls a guy. Hey, I got $5,000 worth of roof tiles. Take them for four and a half grand. Come pick them up right now. Bang, you may lose 500 bucks. Bang, 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 bang. Transaction done. Doesn't lose a sponsor. Make it very, very easy for people to pay you and never, never, never say no to money. Ever. 62. This is some basic shit you should already know. You need to diversify to become anti-fragile against attacks. And when I say this, I'm talking particularly about big tech and also the way you accept money. So the, the, the reason I put these in the order I have is because they all lead into each other. So if you're like Sebastian, you're anti-fragile. You're very anti-fragile because the way he takes money makes him very, very hard to stop. So let's say the IRS or the tax services were to come along and freeze Sebastian's bank account. He'll still run his shows because he can just take roof tiles roof tiles and lumber and alcohol. He doesn't give a fuck. He runs a show and by the end of it, he's sitting on fucking 400 bottles of vodka, enough roof tiles and lumber to build three medium sized homes. He's fine. Cause this is how Romanians are. They're wheeler dealers, they're hustlers. This is the hustlers university, it's about hustling. You wanna give me a whole bunch of wood and some bottles of fucking wine? Cool, give me it. Sebastian's anti-fragile now. You can block his bank, doesn't make a difference. Can't stop that man, he's running the shows. He's getting wood. Doesn't give a fuck. Be anti-fragile. So the more ways you take money, the more anti-fragile you are because a bank may freeze your account or you might lose a particular merchant account. So you need to have lots of different merchant accounts, Bitcoin, lots of different ways to take money. You need lots of different banks. But also you need to be anti-fragile in the places you advertise. You need to be on all the platforms, even the ones that aren't so, so, so successful because the successful ones will get banned. I am on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube with two channels, Telegram, You've got to be everywhere, all the time. Not even if it's just to reach new people, even if it's to reach the same people different ways because shit gets fucking destroyed. You have to be anti-fragile. The easiest way to be anti-fragile is to diversify. I talk about this in one of my tape speech videos, which we're gonna reference in here, about you can't go off grids. You need to be on as many grids as possible. Interesting question. If you guys want to ask me a question, you can email me, email address is at the bottom, or hit me up on my Instagram at Cobra Tate if you really have an important question and answer it. I've got a question saying, what should you do when you make money? That's one of the first things you should do when you make money. And this is actually interesting because it's actually something I recommend you guys do now, whether you have a lot of money or not. But we live in a world now of globalization and it's nearly impossible to be off grid. It's impossible to be beyond the sphere of government control if you want to live a life worth living. You're gonna need a bank account. Crypto helps a lot, but you're still gonna need a bank account. You're gonna need a passport. You're gonna need a driver's license, a license. You're gonna need all of these things. So the idea of living off grid is if you want a very simplistic life. If you want a modern life, living off grid is gonna be impossible. For a long time, I pondered what's the best way to live off grid? What's the best way to avoid a single government having influence over me? Because one of the main reasons I don't care about politics is because I don't consider myself having a leader. I'm in Romania now, I don't know who the leader is. And if a leader came who I really dislike, I can move. I live in countries where I don't know who the leader is and, and the world doesn't know and nobody gives a shit. So I like that. I like feeling like a citizen of the world as opposed to stuck in one place. One of the first things I recommend you do, and this is what I did when I realized that going off grid is impossible, is actually put yourself on as many grids as possible. I've said to some of my friends who have like five grand in the bank, we'll go five grand in the bank, I wanna spend it on a holiday. I say, no, if you're gonna spend five grand on a holiday, Fuck that, you're gonna come out with nothing. You just spend that five grand going to another country, going into the local DVLA or the Department of Driving or whatever it is, and find out what it takes to get a driver's license. I say this to people and people call me crazy, but I think it's far more crazy that people don't do this. We live in a world now where if you're American, you can fly to England, or if you're England, you can fly to America. You can go into the office that issues driver's licenses. You can say, what do I need to get a driver's license? I've just moved to the country. They can say, you need proof of residence, you need a bank account, you need X, Y, Z. And you can spend a couple weeks going through the fucking process, getting what you need, doing a driving test, and passing a driving test, and having a license in a foreign country. And when I say people do this, they go, why? What do you mean, why? If you have one driver's license, then that country can take your license at a whim and restrict you from moving and making money for going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. People call me crazy when I say I have seven driver's licenses. I have seven licenses from seven countries. And each year, I take two weeks out of my year to go to a country, Park up, if I have to get a rental agreement, I get a rental agreement. If I need to get a bank account, I get a bank account. 
anything it takes to and go through the motions. Sometimes I haven't even got to do a test. Sometimes if I prove I have another license, they just give me a license. Anything it takes to have a license so that when I am stopped by the police for speeding, which is all the fucking times I have Lamborghini, Aston Martin, and Bentley, I drive how I fucking want. I'm not going to live like a little cuck. It's 50 miles an hour. If I do 55 miles an hour, they're going to take it away from me. This is how people live under government control, suppressed and afraid. I'm going to lose my license. If you stop me in America, I'll pull out a Polish license. What are you going to do? Call Poland? What's the fucking kit officer going to do? You were speeding. Yeah, sorry. I have to give you a ticket. No problem. We should take your license. We have to deal with Poland about that. I don't even know how the process works if you try to take a Polish license. I don't think the American cops have even have a jur jurisdiction over a Polish license. I always say I don't think. But I do know that they don't. People, an American cop cannot take the license of another nation. They can't do anything. Every country I'm in, I just pull out different licenses. I get stopped for speeding five times a week. No one does shit. Because I have so many driver's licenses and you guys should do the same thing. And the point of this story is the first thing you do when you get money is you need to prevent a single government having access or control over your entire life. Same thing with passports, man. If I fuck up big time and England wants me in jail, I could fly on a Nigerian passport, or an American, or an English, or a Polish, or an Estonian. I have so many fucking passports. What, are you gonna block them all? I, I've got four more I haven't even named on YouTube. They can't stop me traveling. There's always a passport I can pull out. There's always a driver's license I can pull out. If you ban one, I've got another one. I've got bank accounts in 19 countries. My shit is diversified. So am I off grid? No, I'm on so many fucking grids. You can't lock the grid on me, because there's too fucking many of them. People are asking me, what's the first thing I should do when I get money? I'll tell you the first thing you should do right now, if you have a little bit of money in the bank, is look it up, because you'll be surprised. Even a license, like a Thai license, Thai is the best. You pull out a Thai driver's license, it's not even in English. It's in those squiggly letters. And they're like, is this real? I'm like, yeah, it's real. You can't drive here on this. Yeah, you can. Google it. If I have an international driver's permit, which I have, which costs 150 bucks, and a Thai license, I can drive in Europe. And they sit there and they look at the Thai license and think, what am I going to do? Call Bangkok? Oh, fuck it. And they let you go. So people say to me, what's the first thing you should do when you get money? The first thing you should do when you get money is at least obtain two passports, at least obtain as a minimum two driver's licenses, and at least as a minimum have bank accounts in two different countries. Otherwise, you're wrong. Otherwise, you're living like a little cuck at the whim of one government. Let me tell you something. Governments are assholes and governments also change. I find it absurd that you motherfuckers right now, all of you watching this right now, are driving to and from work. You need a car for your livelihood. You need a car to pay your mortgage. And you're living in a world where if you go 10 miles per hour with the speed limit, they're going to take that away from you. And you've done absolutely nothing to negate that. People call me crazy for having eight licenses. I think having one license is fucking crazy. Get it done. And the basic lesson behind this is very simple. You need to be able to take money so many different ways into so many different banks. Here, remember what I said earlier? This is your business. You're taking money so many different ways into so many different places. You're advertising yourself in so many different places that you're near impossible to stop. This is how you need to think about anti-fragility. And this is another reason why the whole idea of being super legal with your company. Oh, I've got my limited company. It's all set up. Here's my limited company and here we are, blah, blah. And, 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 and we fill, I file our taxes. That are, they can come along and close you down like that. You should have eight limited companies and eight different bank accounts and nine different payment processors. You're a hustler. Hustlers can take money. Even if you're all do, even if it's just one company, even if, you're, even if you're still fulfilling it from the same warehouse, even if you're doing one thing, find a way so that you're very, very difficult to pin down. Like, who is this guy? He froze two of his banks. He's still driving a Lambo. How? This is a lesson from my personal life. I'm telling you. Anti-fragility comes from diversification. So, you can get one bullshit member of staff and make their job. Okay, we already have one payment processor. Stripe said yes to us, let's say. I want to be on every other payment processor. Sign us up for them all. Get them all approved. Put them all on, sh on, on websites, exact clones of our current website, on domains that we don't make active yet. Be ready to roll. 